Good afternoon or good morning, depending on your time zone. I'm Rob Capazello, Executive Vice President of Services at Mariner, your host for the webinar today. I know you're all very busy and we sincerely appreciate you sharing your valuable time with us today. I'll provide some quick housekeeping information before I introduce and turn over the meeting to today's speakers. Uh, we have two, Stephen Welch and Peter Darrow. A little housekeeping, you should notice a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to enter a question at any time. And at the conclusion of the presentation, we will take time to get your question answered. If time does not permit, we will follow up with you after the webinar and or provide an opportunity for you to speak directly with Stephen or Peter about your particular challenge. So a little bit about Mariner and what we do. Uh, Mariner is a long-time Microsoft Gold partner, and for 20 years, we've provided data analytics, data science, data warehousing services, and products to the manufacturing industry. Our purpose in life is to help our clients create value from their data, and our goals are very simple, to help you reduce costs, increase your margins, or to generate new revenue. Today, we hope to give you a glimpse of how we're doing this for clients in the automotive manufacturing sector. We'll be discussing our spyglass visual inspection solution, a quality inspection and classification solution that leverages deep learning and convolutional neural networks. It's my pleasure now to introduce our two speakers. Stephen Welch is Mariner's Vice President of Data Science. Prior to joining Mariner, Stephen was Vice President of Machine Learning for an autonomous driving company. Stephen is also an adjunct professor at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, teaching graduate level classes in machine learning and computer vision. Your second speaker will be Peter Darrow. Peter is Mariner's Vice President of Products. Peter leads the product delivery and the architecture practice at Mariner. And for 20 years, Peter has been dedicated to building data analytics solutions for diverse organizations and industries, leveraging the power of IoT, machine learning, and advanced analytics. Okay, and now I'll pass the meeting over to Stephen Welch. Great, thank you, Rob. Um, so thanks for joining us today, everyone. Um, so I think we have an interesting webinar planned for you here, and uh, we went over the schedule a little bit earlier, and we'll, uh, we'll, there'll be about three parts to this. Um, I'm going to start with AI in general and how that applies to manufacturing, and then I'll hand it over to Peter, and then I'll, I'll finish with a deep dive into uh, deep learning for visual inspection. Um, so AI is a really hot word right now. It kind of gets thrown around a lot, which um, it sometimes is a little bit uh, frustrating because it can be a little general and kind of a loaded term. Um, so I think it's helpful at the beginning here to unpack it a little bit and then be really clear about what we mean when we say AI, at least here at Mariner. Um, so uh, AI has a really interesting history. So uh, it's really come in, in three different waves, once first in the 1960s, once in the 80s, and once in the 2010s. Um, and when anyone said AI in those decades, they were referring to something pretty different usually. So um, we'll get into those into some detail here. <clears throat> so uh, AI really dates back to the beginning of the computer age. So pretty much as soon as we had computers, researchers were thinking about how can we make them intelligent. Um, and the field actually had a lot of success really early on. Um, so a lot of problems that seemed really difficult, like playing checkers or solving geometric proofs, things like that, um, were actually solved very quickly. Um, so on the bottom right here, this is a good example. Um, so this is a researcher named Arthur Samuel. Um, he actually coined the phrase machine learning. Um, and he wrote an algorithm that, that could play checkers. Um, and it was really fascinating because pretty quickly on this old IBM 701 computer, um, his algorithm by playing against itself got so good that it actually beat its creator. So it was actually a very good checkers player um, and was better than Arthur Samuel, um, which was pretty remarkable. Um, so there's a lot of excitement in the early days of, of AI. Um, and that led to a little bit of optimism, which I think you see, you see, uh, you see, echo, you see echoes of that today. Um, but there's this great quote in 1965 from Herbert Simon, who was an AI researcher and also a Nobel laureate. Uh, the quote is, uh, machines will be capable within 20 years of doing any work a man can do. Um, so obviously, you know, back in the 60s, they were a little over optimistic, right? But there was real work being done, right? So I think, I think part of what's interesting here is to try to draw that distinction between where is the real value being created, what's the real technology, and what's kind of the hype. And we're going to try to do that today with deep learning because the, the same kind of rules apply where um, it's being overhyped in some areas, but there really is a core uh, value there. So hopefully we can tease that apart uh, today. So I think it's interesting to think you know, what did these researchers get wrong, right? These are very smart people. Um, what did they get wrong in the 60s? Um, there's a lot to unpack here. Here's two books I recommend if you want to dig deeper, um, but I'll just pull out a quote from each that really kind of summarizes some of the issues with this first wave of AI. 
Um, the first one is probably from the best AI book out there. Uh, it's by uh, Peter Russell and, and, and Norvig. Um, so this quote is, the fact that a program can find a solution in principle um, does not mean that the program has any of the mechanisms needed to find it in practice. Um, so what that meant is that the, these early solutions in the early days of AI, they really didn't scale very well. So this idea is called the combinatorial explosion, where um, maybe the, the AI algorithm could play checkers or something, but it really wouldn't ex scale well to games like chess, for example, let alone real world problems. Um, so that was one issue. The algorithms didn't scale very well. Um, a second lesson from the early days of AI I think is, is fascinating. It's called Morvex Paradox. Um, and it's this idea that the, the hard problems are easy and the easy problems are hard. Um, so this quote goes on to say that the mental abilities of a four-year-old that we take for granted, uh, recognizing a face, lifting a pencil, walking across a room, um, these are in fact some of the hardest engineering problems ever conceived. Um, so it turns out that things like computer vision, like perception, are actually really hard, even though our brains are good at doing them. So that, that's an easy mistake to make in the early days, which is, which is something that happened to, to early researchers. They thought that, you know, geometry was harder than vision, which, which it's not. Um, so that was the 60s. And then in the 80s, there was a second big wave of AI. And it's interesting because the, the technology that got coined AI in the 80s was entirely different from the technology in the 60s and entirely different from the technology today. Um, they're very different approaches. So I'll talk about the approach from the 80s a little bit, or at least the dominant approach. Um, so the, the real excitement in the 80s was around a technology called expert systems. Um, so I'll, I'll explain what an expert system is through an example. Um, so the first customer or company to really profit from expert systems um, was a company called uh, DEC. So they made these big computers. Um, these were really hard to configure. So DEC had a bunch of different parts. Um, and the challenge was, how do I fit all those parts together to make a computer that will actually boot up and, and do something? Um, they had a lot of returned orders and even lawsuits by shipping the wrong sets of components because their sales staff, you know, didn't have the technical acumen to configure the computers because it was really hard. Um, so what they did is they, they, they hired a professor from Carnegie Mellon named John McDermott, um, and he came to DEC and he built an expert system uh, using a LISP. Um, and that system, it, 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 he took a bunch of rules from the experts at DEC. So he sat down in a room, wrote up all the rules from the experts at DEC and made that into an algorithm. Um, and that at the time was what was called AI. Um, this system worked really, really well for DEC. Apparently it was saving them on the order of $40 million a year pretty quickly um, by really replicating what the experts would have done by you know, manually coding up the experts rules. So that was AI in the 80s um, and <laughs> again, had a big business impact. Um, it kind of was less popular in the 90s. Things fizzled a little bit. Expert systems are still around. We just don't call them that anymore. Um, but AI kind of was less popular in the, in the 90s, or at least the term was. Um, and then the last wave, the reason that, 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 that AI is talked about today really is because of innovation around 2012. Um, so that's driving this, this third wave of AI. And this innovation was in the field that I work in, which is computer vision. Um, and it really comes down to one paper, in my opinion. So there's this paper from 2012 by this group at the University of Toronto. Um, and this paper, uh, it presents a, a method for solving a problem on a data set called ImageNet. So ImageNet at the time was the, the most difficult uh, data set in computer vision. So it's around 1.3 million images. Um, and each image is labeled with one class. For example, an image could have a dog or a cat or a tree. Um, and the challenge is to predict that label, to classify an image um, from the pixels alone. So just given the image, can we classify it? Um, in 2010, the very best algorithms in the world had an error rate of around 28%. Um, and that's with five guesses. So they got five guesses and they only, had a, uh, only got it right 70% um, of the time. Um, in 2012, with the publication of this, of this paper, um, these researchers using a deep learning model were able to improve performance by around 40%. Um, and in the following four years, teams kind of piled on using a similar approach, a, a deep learning based approach, um, until in 2015, when researchers at Microsoft um, achieved better than human performance on this data set. Um, and that model is called ResNet. Um, ResNet, that, that specific type of deep learning model, that's the technology we use in our uh, applications, at least in our vision applications. Um, and we'll detail those later about, you know, how does this really apply uh, when it shows up in manufacturing. But that, that's the technology that we're, we're leveraging, and that's a little bit about where it, where it came from. And just to give you a little feel, and, and I won't spend too much time on this and we'll keep moving here, but just to give you a feel for, you know, what is this deep learning thing? How is this team able to 
to beat this previous performance. Uh, I'll just do two slides on deep learning real quick, and then I'll talk about applications briefly, and I'll hand it over to Peter. Um, so here's deep learning in a nutshell. Um, this is a figure from what I consider to be the only good deep learning book. Um, there's a lot of books out there. In my opinion, this is the only good one, but it's very good. Um, and this is one of the first figures from the book. Um, and it's trying to give you a feeling for how these deep learning models are working. So in deep learning, we take an image. This is an image of a person. And the idea is, can we take all these pixels and make a prediction, right? So here we want to correctly predict that this shows a person. Um, in deep learning, and this is a little different than traditional machine learning, and I'll show you one slide on that in a second. Um, but in deep learning, we want to learn this mapping from these input pixel values all the way to predictions. And these errors that you see here are, are mathematical operations called convolutions. Um, and really, you can think about it as a bunch of multipl multiplications and additions. Um, in a deep learning model, it, its job is to learn these mappings. So it learns the numbers that describe how to compute um, each layer of representation. And when I say layer of representation, what I'm talking about is that when you actually open these things up so that they learn from data, but when you open them up, you see that they learn features like this. So this little pattern would be very effective at detecting edges. We would call that an edge detector. We didn't program this edge detector. The model actually learned it from data. Um, but these models end up learning these stacked representations where they take a bunch of edges, they put those together to form things like corners, and they put those together to form things like faces. Um, and by learning these layers of representation, these systems can deliver dramatically better performance than previous approaches. So that's really what's going on on the inside. And I'll just make a brief comparison between uh, deep learning and other types of machine learning. Um, and, then, and then as I said, we'll, we'll move on. Um, but just to give you a little more context here, um, here's a few different ways to solve problems with computers. Um, the approach on the far left here, this rules-based system. So this is really how those expert systems in the 1980s worked. So you have some kind of input, you have a hand-designed program, and you have an output. In this figure, the shaded blocks, those correspond to components that are learned from data. In classic machine learning, we have this two-step pipeline. Um, so first, we take our raw data, like our pixels or our audio samples, whatever, um, and we extract some hand-designed features. So you may design a, a contrast feature that measures what is the contrast of this image, for example. You then take those, and then you train a learning algorithm to predict the output you want, like uh, detecting a, a human in an image, for example. So that's classic machine learning. Um, in representation learning, we learn both of those steps. So instead of uh, manually designing this by hand, we learn both those steps. And in deep learning, we have several layers, three or more layers of learning that happens. Um, so that's the difference between classic machine learning and deep learning. Um, and again, in, in practice, uh, for certain problems, especially problems in vision and, and a few other areas, um, you can get much better performance by learning the whole mapping. And this really is how the field has changed in the last five to 10 years. Okay, so that's all I'll say about the technology. Please ask questions if you want to or set up a call with us. You know, we could talk about this for, for, for a great length, um, but I'll keep it short for now. Um, there are many really exciting applications of deep learning. Um, if you've used Amazon Alexa, you've used deep learning, image recognition, all, all kinds of uh, problems out there. Um, in manufacturing, you're seeing these come online more and more. Um, deep learning itself is arguably five to ten years old. It's taken a little while for this technology to percolate into manufacturing, but it really is coming into its own. Um, so one area is, is certainly quality control and quality assurance. So I'm going to speak about this at the, at the end of the webinar. Um, Peter is going to talk about predictive maintenance and monitoring and alerting. And there's other really interesting applications as well here. Um, so I'm, I'll hand it over to Peter here, and I just want to say that, you know, in this, I think uh, we have a good line up here because my, my perspective is a little bit more on the technology uh, algorithm side, and Peter has a lot of really great experience in the deployment and not only the technological issues that you face, but also some of the business issues you may face when trying to deploy these systems. So uh, without further ado, I will hand it over to Peter. Excellent, Stephen. Uh, thank you. So you want to be in manufacturing? change agent well we want you to be one too and the goal here is to change and in order to change you have to move and the goal therefore is to move rearrange any combination of your organization's goals behaviors and assets and in many respects organizations are living organisms and the physiology of moving is this organisms move to improve their situation and they move real fast when they're scared and the fastest way to move an organism or an organization is to scare it However, 
You can only frighten people for a short time, but maybe a short window is all you need. An executive I know told me at the time he presented to his leadership team a press release from his competitors explaining their new capability. It was kind of ethical because after the leadership freaked out, he explained it was fake, but he did get his project funded. But if you can't use a short term scare to get your organization to move, then you're gonna to have to sell your idea. And there's lots of advice everywhere on how change agents influence people. And if you search for change management, there's even more. But if you wanna be a change agent in manufacturing, then I suggest Industry 4.0. It's a change management plan to rule them all. A plan to change the entire ecosystem of Germany's industrial machinery manufacturers to retain their goal of dominance, global dominance in the 21st century. How's that for a change in your playbook? And that is why I suggest 4.0 is pertinent for a webinar on AI manufacturing. Look at the AI contributors to that working group paper. IOT, artificial intelligence, are essential capabilities for an industry 4.0 play. And 4.0 needs AI to accomplish these things. IOT and AI are tools for change agents because they can generate the most disruptive changes due to their different approach to familiar problems. And these are some of the goals of 4.0. Feel free to graze the other advice the Industry 4.0 plan includes, but I'm gonna talk about these two topics. <clears throat> to avoid scaring yourself, be aware of what might happen and plan around it. And the following explains what can happen to the inexperienced change agents when they execute or select a pilot project. And why a pilot project? Well, people do projects, people do projects to avoid scaring yourself. It's a safety mechanism. And if the pilot is an escape plan for the stakeholders when their AI can't deliver, then an even better plan is to avoid AI altogether. We've helped a VP of manufacturing wanted to create a culture responsibility in his processing plant. And we wanted to help the engineers of a product company that wanted customers to follow procedures on their heavy equipment. And we've helped the maintenance manager of a chemical process to take advantage of unplanned downtime with the smartest choice of maintenance jobs to match the outtenance window. And we help them by combining statistical analysis and rules born of their experience as applied to real-time telemetry. No AI was required to deliver those complex decisions in real time. But if you do need AI to deliver results, then I have a list of five ways to trash your pilot and perhaps your change agent dreams as well. And I cite them so you can recognize the danger and avoid failure. Number one, not having the data you need. Artificial intelligence learns from inference, not deduction. Learners learn from good signals and raw data, vision accepted, often doesn't contain good signals. Sensors often measure what the machine is doing, but sometimes many of them don't even know what product they're making at the time, or even if they're supposed to be stopped. Data danger, poor accuracy. Is blocked really the overwhelming reason for short stop reasons on this machine, or is it just because it's top of the list? Another example of data danger. You expect humans to make mistakes, but machine generated data can have mistakes too. Telemetry data isn't always complete or perfect. This is a faulty sensor. It should rise and fall in harmony with the other tags, but it wasn't installed correctly. Two, not creating business value. Those who are responsible for, for the production process should determine the business value, but it's your responsibility as a change agent to make them do it. And don't pick a success criteria because the AI IoT people love it, but the stake something the stakeholders don't value. In one situation, we were asked to maximize production, but the other stakeholders wanted to maximize yield. The physical process didn't allow for both at the same time. Sometimes the processes with the most reliable data are also the best run operations, with little room for improvement and no great desire to take risks on new technology. Don't pick a problem no one asked you to solve just because you got the data to solve it. And without a permanent change, you're really not a change agent. Solving a short-term project is just a project. An example, we, uh, one of our customers used Spyglass to identify one of the compressors was tripping, figure out why that was happening. And once an AI model found the reason, they just removed the root cause. And it was a one-time AI model. Three, expecting high accuracy. The accuracy level should be determined with a risk-adjusted ROI calculation. It tells you how accurate you'd be versus being told what you're supposed to do. So, hey, you can only have one false positive per this, or we need X percent accuracy. For example, in a predictive maintenance situation, you need to consider the cost of performing the inspection, shutting down the process, doing the work, the cost versus the cost of letting the machine fail. And the calculations also got to include the consequences of lost production, slowing the machine down, 
kind of multiply all those probabilities out, then you'll have a single number that states the value of your IoT project or your AI project. And if you don't have agreement on the accuracy level, then you can't prove how much your IoT or AI change the business and you can't be a change agent if you can't measure the change to the business. Don't do an AI project with high profile, high stakes, where the downside of being wrong is way more than the upside of being right. But do consider a project that improves something even by a small amount, as it can be profitable if the number of decision volumes and its velocity is very high. Four, expecting AI to explain its decisions. If your AI models are based on complex trees, decision forest, GBM, or any related convoluted you know, neural nets, it's gonna be hard to explain why the model made the prediction it did. And for one-off situations, you can review traces and weights and assess the influence of certain variables. But every suspicious classification prediction, if that has to be explained, you're gonna spend forever providing evidence and do nothing about moving your project forward. TNN, convoluted neural nets, they're called that for a reason. Whereas regression and parametric methods, i.e. those that use probability distributions, are easier to explain to engineers because statistics is familiar to them. Deep learning models are not parametric models. They approximate a complex function and they do so in a convoluted way. Now, visual inspection is the exception. It's an extremely good candidate for CNN because people can validate decision literally with their own eyes and your eyes will get a chance to experience it in the latter half of Stephen's presentation. These expectations are hard to fulfill with deep learning and complex trees and ensembles. The stakeholders will be scared of operationalizing it and the lack of explainability can kill a project and therefore kill your change agent plans. And don't be blind to the success of AI scaring or embarrassing skilled stakeholders. One pilot we did, and it's an emphasis, it was a pilot. The system outperformed the humans. A problem skilled engineers were looking at for a long time was solved in a few weeks with AI. It was never operationalized. Never underestimate ego. Fifth, fear of operationalizing. This is the scariest part of the pilot. You're actually gonna to have to go make it into production. And if you can't get it operationalized, then there's no change. And no change means there's no change agent certificate for you. How you overcome these objections is the same as you would with other projects. But any of those solutions have to convert fear of change into fear of doing nothing. Here are other reasons or excuses you need to be constantly vigilant for and ready to deal with. Those are the five reasons your pilot won't become a permanent change. And those are the same five reasons you won't be recognized as a change agent. But as I mentioned earlier, you can be a successful change agent on the flat tree floor, even if your IA isn't the best. Having these capabilities will make you a serious 4.0 contender and delivering these capabilities certainly makes the next AI project much less scary. So if you wanna be a change agent, we want you to be one too. Man is a three-step process to become part of your change agent future. And to make it less scary, we offer a money back guarantee. So don't be scared, be a change agent, Stephen. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Peter. All right, good. So uh, I'll hang, take, take back over here. And uh, the, the last portion of our webinar here before we hop to Q&A, um, we are going to do a deep dive into an area where, you know, I think Peter you know, did a really great job of covering um, what to look out for as you go into these projects and how different kinds of projects will be better or worse fits for, for deep learning or for AI. Um, so we're going to show you two now that are really good fits and, and hopefully that um, gives some more context as you think about the own the challenges that you face at your organization. Um, this will hopefully help you put a little more context around some areas where um, deep learning or AI really do apply well. So um, the area that I work on at Mariner primarily is visual inspection. Um, and vision is one of those areas where there's a, uh, in many cases, a very direct application of deep learning that, that can deliver some really good results. Um, to understand how the deep learning applies here or deep learning applies here, um, it's helpful to spend a little bit of time thinking about how the technology works today. So machine vision is not new. It's been around for at least since the 1980s um, and delivering value for all kinds of problems. Um, traditionally, machine vision works in, in a, a two-step process. So there, there's some kind of image capture component uh, and some kind of compute component. Um, this could be integrated with the camera and a smart camera, or it could be a separate PC. Um, there's some kind of software running on there. Um, at the heart of this is, is some kind of computer vision algorithm. 
Um, and its job is to take in these raw pixel values in the image and make some kind of prediction that you use to feed a, an HMI or a diversion gate or a robot or it goes to a PLC. Um, but that, that's really where machine vision sits. And traditionally, um, as we talked about uh, in the earlier part of the presentation, um, <clears throat> the uh, most computer vision algorithms, and, and still today in manufacturing, they don't use deep learning. So what they use instead is this, this two-step process of feature extraction and decisioning. So I'll just talk about those a little bit. Um, so this is a, a real image from one of our customers that they, they let us use here. Um, this is an image of, of fabric, and there's a defect in the fabric. That's a, that's a hole, a hole in the fabric. Feature extraction consists of taking those raw pixel values in here and computing some other numbers, we call them features, um, that can help us make a decision. The number that we're showing here that we're computing is the contrast. So we're taking a little sliding window and we're moving it across the image. Um, and for every little window, we're computing what is the difference between the darkest and the lightest pixel in that window. For this region, you can see that this area is kind of glowing, right? Um, that's because that area is a region of high contrast. The contrast is a pretty typical signal that you would use then. Uh, you can compute other features such as defect size, for example, and you would take those features and you would usually, not always, but a, a common thing to do is to apply a threshold. So you say, hey, if my contrast is over 100, then it must be a defect. Um, <clears throat> you can, of course, threshold on other variables as well, um, and then you make your decision based on that. So this two-step approach of feature extraction and decisioning, that's really the state of the art. That's how it's worked for a long time. Uh, what we're doing at Spyglass and what's really happening in computer vision just broadly is that you're seeing this two-step pipeline being replaced by deep learning. Um, that the, the graph that I showed in the first part of the talk where we saw the performance on that open source data set improve so dramatically, um, that's because the researchers switched from this approach to this approach that published that paper. Um, let's just talk about why you might want to switch first. Um, so, uh, something very interesting that we're seeing play out right now, especially in vision, is we're seeing to what extent deep learning is going to replace or augment existing technologies. Um, there are some problems in vision where this two-step approach is still the way to go, um, but there are some problems, and we're going to show you two, where deep learning really can deliver a lot of value. Um, where this approach can go wrong sometimes um, is it can be, I think a really good word for it is, is brittle. Um, so you have these images. Now imagine this was instead of being a hole, imagine this was just a piece of, of lint or flock on the fabric, right? Um, so if this was a piece of flock, it would be very difficult to tune all these parameters to correctly identify the flock as not being a defect, but identify the hole as a defect. Um, in practice, a lot of commercial vision systems, they give you a lot of controls. So we have one customer, um, they have a system that does exactly this, um, and they have 300 different thresholds to tune, right? So um, they have an amazing team of really good quality engineers, but there's no way they're going to be able to find the right combination of parameters. So <clears throat> what that means is that they have this system that's very difficult to tune and maintain. So again, not all vision you know, systems run into that problem, but for the ones that do, for the problems that are like that, um, deep learning can really deliver a lot of value. Um, and just to put it in a nutshell again here, as we showed in the earlier section of the presentation, in deep learning, we're gonna directly map from a, an image to a prediction. So we're gonna learn this whole mapping, no more two steps. Um, there are a couple of trade-offs you make when going to deep learning. Um, the first one to be aware of is that instead of having your experts kind of learn how vision systems work and tune these parameters, you're instead going to use their time to make a labeled data set. So these models learn from labeled data, um, and that's how they do so well. Um, and that's something you wouldn't do here, right? You would spend your time tuning, but you wouldn't be labeling a data set. So um, just something to be aware of, and we'll get into detail about what that labeling uh, looks like. So as promised, we have, we have two examples for you. Uh, the first one is glass in glass manufacturing, um, and the second one is going to be in fabric. <clears throat> so this was an existing vision system at one of our, our customers. Um, we've generally found that the vision systems out there have very good imaging capabilities. So they take very high quality images, and then the problem is not usually in the hardware. For this vision system, it, just took excellent, it takes excellent images of glass. Glass is hard to photograph, but the system does a great job. Um, the challenge was their software, again, didn't use deep learning. It was a traditional computer vision approach, um, and they had a high false reject rate. So they were rejecting sometimes up to 25% of, of parts that were actually good. Um, one of the major causations for that 
um, was the glass being wet. So there's a cleaning step a few stages before this on the production line. Uh, the glass would get wet and little water droplets uh, look a lot like surface defects or a lot like chips. Um, so teasing those two classes apart um, is a real challenge. And they tried non-AI uh, approaches first. They tried to blow off the glass, things like that. That's also pretty difficult. So um, this was a situation where really uh, there was not an obvious, easy other solution. And really, we could come in a uh, train a deep learning model and really deliver some value. So I'll get into the numbers here of, of what our performance is. Um, so this confusion matrix on the left, this represents the performance of the system um, when we showed up. So this is the current existing vision system. Um, so one of the first things we do is we, we collect a labeled data set. So working with your experts, um, we label a data set. Um, you can, as far as data set size to start with, we try to shoot for around 50 examples of each class, of each uh, thing you wanna classify. Um, in this case, the, uh, we had a data set with 45 images of defective uh, pieces of glass, um, 50 images of good pieces of glass, and 30 images of wet pieces of glass. Um, as you can see, their current system did a great job at good versus defective, um, but these 30 wet uh, pieces of glass were labeled as defective, leading to a high false positive or false reject rate of around 25%. So we came in and we trained that ResNet deep learning classification model. Um, and actually, we thought we were going to just crush this problem. We thought we were going to deliver incredible performance. Uh, when we first trained, we actually had like 80% accuracy, and I was kind of bummed about it. <laughs> and we, we looked deeper into the, um, into the data, and we realized that there was certain images where um, our system was, was getting confused. Basically, it was predicting as defective that were labeled by, as good by the manufacturer. Um, we looked closer and we saw something that looked like a defect, but a different kind of defect. Um, we went and asked the experts and they told us actually it is a defect, um, a special kind of defect in glass that's a little harder to see. Um, <clears throat> but it is a real defect, which we were happy to hear about. Um, and by adding this defect to our classes, we were able to get some really good performance with a false reject rate of less than 1%. Um, so a, an advantage I would say of <clears throat> going through this process is it actually, it really forces your human experts to agree and be thorough because they're being validated against the model and, and, and the reverse. So the, the model is trained from the human experts, but if you have two experts who kind of disagree, um, the model will definitely draw that out. Um, so uh, I think that really, and Peter made a great point about this, just the process of doing this stuff is valuable organizationally. Uh, forget about the results. The results are great too, um, but even just the process uh, can really work wonders for quality. All right, so um, there's one other thing I want to mention about these deployments. So I, I talked about how, you know, when you go from traditional machine vision to deep learning, one of the trade-offs is that you have to label a data set. That's the first one. Um, the second one to be aware of is that deep learning is significantly more computationally intensive than regular computer vision. So you need two to three orders of magnitude more computing power to do deep learning. You need a more powerful computer. Um, we've invested a lot in this piece of the puzzle. Um, so it's becoming cheaper and easier to train these models. We think there's, there's value in being an expert at training these models. And we certainly, we think we have that, that, that skill set at Mariner, we, we do. Um, but we really are investing a lot of time in the infrastructure to deploy these models because it doesn't matter how good your performance is. Um, if you can't deploy it in real time on the factory floor, it doesn't really matter. Um, so we are a Microsoft Gold partner, as Rob mentioned, and we're built on, on top of a technology stack called Azure IoT Edge. Um, and what it allows us to do is to deploy these models um, to the factory floor on GPU accelerated hardware. So a, a GPU is a, a specialized computing device that allows us to do um, computations in a massively parallel way so we can process uh, data really quickly. Um, and what we do is we deploy these devices to the factory floor um, and these actually do the inference or the decisioning uh, in real time. Um, you really couldn't do this in the cloud. You know, it has to work without internet connection. Um, this is the system we deployed to the glass manufacturer. Um, and just for reference, they have, they have really high resolution images. Um, we can process one of their images in about 100 milliseconds. Uh, we can go faster if we need to for other applications, but for them that was about right because they needed, they needed a decision in about three to five seconds. Um, so that's a little bit about deployment and we're happy to answer questions about that, but I wanna go ahead and hop into one more example just so you have a little bit more to think about as you're thinking about um, where deep learning uh, may apply to your organization. So the second example here is from, from Automotive Fabric, <clears throat> and this is their existing vision system. So this manufacturer had pretty significant capital investment in, in hardware to do this kind of thing. 
Um, and again, the, 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 the imaging capabilities of their current system are quite good. Um, they, they, there's no image quality issues, right? So it doesn't make sense to rip and replace all this stuff. Really what you need is a, a layer of intelligence on top of this, which is what we are doing. Um, so this is their existing system. Uh, this is for fabric. Um, imagine a roll of fabric flying through this machine at a high rate of speed. Um, there's eight cameras in here. Um, the roll of fabric is about 10 feet wide. Um, and these cameras take pictures whenever um, they detect an issue. Um, the output of this system is what's called a defect map. Here's a defect map. Um, and every point here is a location along the roll where the system believes there to be a defect. Just to give you a sense for scale here briefly, uh, the length of the roll is about 900 yards, so about half a mile, and the width is about 10 feet. This is in inches, so 120 inches. Every point here results in an image, so the system takes an image. Um, some of the images are true defects. This is a seam in the fabric. Uh, this is what's called an indout, it's a certain kind of defect. Um, these are more subtle defects, um, but these are actually good. These are not, um, not defective. The current system is triggering off these for reasons we described earlier. Basically, it's brittle and it's difficult to tune the rules to catch this kind of defect and reject that kind of defect. It's very difficult to do that with the traditional approach to computer vision. The result here is that, that of these points that get spit out in the defect map, um, in practice, up to like 40% of them were actually not defects. So again, a very high false reject rate. So the task here is can we use deep learning to improve our performance, to reduce that false reject rate, and ideally to identify different kinds of defects for root cause analysis so they can make uh, improvements to production um, quickly. So here we'll talk a little bit about the labeling process. So as I mentioned at the beginning of these projects, the first thing we do is we, we, we sit down with your experts and we, we make a label data set. So this was the label data set for this customer. Um, and what, what, what we proposed here is that they solve this using a technique called classification. So you can actually do a lot with deep learning. You can, you can predict like where a defect is, you can predict a segmentation mask, all kinds of stuff. But for, for most customers, if it, if it makes sense, we'll start with what's called classification. And that's where you try to predict one unique label for each image. So if each image corresponds to one kind of defect, and again, we can do it with multiple defects or different kinds of things, but this is usually a good starting point. If, if each image can be uniquely classified into one class, um, we'll do that. So here we have examples of this defect called end out. Here's examples of a defect called stop marks. Um, these two columns represent examples of false, so those are actually not defective. And this is a class called flock. This is little pieces of lint getting on the fabric. So those are our classes, we have around 10, um, and these examples serve as the basis for training our deep learning model. So from there, we go and train our model. Um, we achieved an accuracy of around 98% for this data set that we're sharing here. Um, what's really important though, and what we do early on in the process, is we, we take a careful look with, with our customers at, at what the model is getting right and what it's getting wrong. Um, we generally do that through a confusion matrix. So here the rows represent the labels. So they represent the labels that we originally made with the customer. And the columns represent the predictions made by our model. So this 108, for example, this means there were 108 examples where the experts said this is a false, it's not actually a defect. And the model agreed for those 108. So for these 108 examples, the model got it correct. Um, so as you can imagine, a, a perfect confusion matrix would only have numbers on the diagonal because the label corresponds to the prediction from the model. So then when we get it wrong, you know, if, if perfect is along the diagonal, then any kind of error is going to show up over here, off diagonal. Um, and as you can imagine, some types of defects are more costly to the business than others. And how you measure this is, is important. Um, so for example, confusing flock and false is not a big deal because these are both false classes. However, doing something like confusing a stain for false, this is not good because basically this represents a stain that is getting through our system and could make it to the customer. Um, and like Peter said, you know, there's no such thing as 100% here, so there's always going to be errors, but it's a, it's a, it's a game of, of, of quantifying what are your errors, how does that compare to what you're doing now, and like Peter said, it's really about measuring what is the business value. And actually, Peter has a really great spreadsheet where he walks through how you can compute what accuracy you need given the business value. Um, but anyway, to, to, to move on here, um, what we'll do then is we'll look at these specific examples and we'll see what is the model getting wrong and what does that mean for the application. So uh, I think what we're showing here, this example, I think it corresponds to this one. No, this one, this one. So in this case, this is actually handwriting. This is writing on the fabric, um, but our model thinks it's flock. Um, this 
part right here looks kind of like fab, like a, you know, just lint on the on the fabric, um, but it's wrong. Um, notice the C here. So when we train a classification model, we get both a prediction and we get a confidence level. So this is this is the confidence level. And in some cases, we won't always do this, but if we have to, what you can do is you can actually filter and you can say, okay, I only want to take predictions above some confidence level. Because even though the model is wrong, it's not terribly confident. So um, that gives you a little bit more flexibility with how you deploy these things. Um, like Peter said, you're never going to have full explainability. I can't tell you analytically why the model says, uh, says a flock, but I can at least say, you know, for this example, it's less confident. So um, just some things to keep in mind as you think about your problem. Um, to, to wrap up this example with some results, um, I'll, I'll show you our final results here and how that kind of compares to, to their benchmarks. Um, <clears throat> we started this project with, um, with seven rolls of fabric. Um, we used five for training and two for testing. Uh, it's very important with deep learning to separate your training and testing set. Uh, it's very easy to do what's called overfitting, where you get very good performance on training and then bad performance on testing. Basically, the model can memorize uh, the training set because uh, the model is really powerful. Um, so it's important to only show your results on examples you did not train on, which is what we're doing here. And the metrics that this customer really cares about are the defects per 100 yards and the false rejects per 100 yards. Um, their current system had around 17 false rejects or false positives per 100 yards. Um, after we trained, we knocked that down to 0.47. Um, so really about a, about a 30, 32x reduction, something like that. Um, this is really, when you have an application like this, you can just show really dramatic results from deep learning, which makes it a fun field to work in when you find the right, the right problem. Um, to get this a little more comparison back to the business though, so, so this, this customer uses manual grading and they're converting that to automatic grading with our system right now, but um, with their manual grading system, they have some, uh, some quality numbers that they have their manual graders hit uh, or targets for their manual graders. Their manual grading targets are to miss less than one defect per 100 yards and uh, have less than one false reject per 100 yards. Um, so compared to their standards for their manual graders, we're about twice as good for false positives and five times as good for catching defects. So um, it can be hard to get those numbers, but that really is the core of the comparison that, that, that can really, you know, like Peter said, uh, being a change agent, you have to have numbers to, to measure. And numbers like that are really helpful, right? We can show how does, how does the deep learning or the AI, how does that compare to your humans or how does it compare to what you're doing today? So um, I encourage you as you're thinking about this to um, spend some time on the business case because that really is, in our experience, how these projects are funded and get momentum and really uh, become, become real. Okay, so just to tie up this example, um, this was the defect map before we cleaned it using deep learning. Um, this is after cleaning. Um, you can see that this makes a, a huge difference and I, I, I can't go into a huge amount of detail about how their production system works, but this has a big impact on their next stage of production. Um, so all of these little dots were false positives, false rejects, and we correctly cleaned out those with a rate of 98%. Um, so that's the kind of difference you can get with, uh, with deep learning. Um, and then just, just two more slides here and then we'll hop to Q&A. Um, so I just, uh, to zoom out a little bit and think about the business impact of having precise, rapid and adaptable visual inspection through deep learning. Um, when we first got into the space and launched this product back in March, uh, we really thought and believed that the main value was to improve output quality, um, which we still believe that, you know, that, that's, that's definitely value that deep learning can provide. Um, however, along the way in talking to customers and deploying these things, we've learned that there's actually a number of other benefits that come along with that. So as you're thinking about the business impact, um, don't only focus on improved output quality. Um, another really awesome area is root cause analysis. Um, and we're seeing more and more customers adopt this. So um, the idea here, right, is that, you know, for, for this, let's take this, this fabric example, right? So um, if they see a certain kind of defect and end out, right, they can go back earlier in production and fix this. Um, so the, again, we're built on top of Azure IoT Edge. So part of what we have is we have the real-time decisioning, um, but we also have a reporting mechanism, right? Where you can get reports and analytics in real time um, off your lines. Um, and you can use that to actually optimize your process. Um, so as soon as, it's, it's funny, a lot of customers are really first focused on the real-time decisioning, which is great. Um, but as soon as they see that this thing actually works, a pretty common follow-up question is, hey, can I see this analytics in real time? Can you tell me how many defects per hour I'm getting on this line? You know, Because um, that can really drive real decision-making um, and the ability to go back and fix issues before they become huge problems. 
Um, so I would say, you know, as you're thinking about how deep learning might apply to your uh, business, um, don't only think about output quality, right? There are other dimensions where deep learning can really deliver value. Okay, and Peter hit on this, and I'll just underline it here. So um, if you want to get started, we have a, we've got really a system we put together to, to pipeline these projects at the beginning. Um, we try to de-risk these as best we can from, from, from early on and really show, you know, first of all, you know, what performance do we need? What is the business problem? Does it really deliver value if we solve this problem? How good does it have to be? And then we, very early on, we train a model off a small data set that we label together. Um, so we do offer a money back guarantee on this first phase of the project and then the whole idea right is that we're going to uh, define what success is we're going to show that we can hit it with deep learning um, if we can't we'll walk away that's fine no problem that deep learning is not for every problem um, but in general this is a pretty good bet for us and we're pretty confident in the, in the technology um, and you can reach out directly to uh, to Peter or myself we'd love to talk to you and hear more about your application um, and I will hand it over to Rob for Q&A <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. We do have a few minutes for some questions and we have gotten a few in. So uh, the first question is, or I can answer this one, are we able to access the recording slides for review after this presentation? Yes, you can. Uh, the entire slide deck will be sent out to you in PDF form. Our second question, is Mariner's SVI product compatible with all vision systems? Uh, yeah, great question. So I think if you want to look at us for some other solutions out there, this is probably a nice differentiator for us. So we are we are highly compatible. Um, as long as we're able to get the image data, we can process it and, and return that output to you on your PLCs or wherever you want. Um, so yes, that, that's I, I think one of the one of our bigger differentiators is that we are compatible across um, a range of existing hardware. All right. Next question is: What if I currently don't have a vision system? Yeah, so when we started, we were pretty focused on the applications where there was a vision system in place, but we've actually run into enough customers now that, uh, that wanted to start with installing a new vision system that we have partnered with a, a very reputable systems integrator um, that handles the hardware for us. We're not hardware folks, but we have partnered with an organization that does that. Um, so if you are looking to start from nothing and get a vision system installed, uh, we have a company we recommend and we work closely with them to build out a whole system for you. All right, I think there's one more. Is Spyglass software that is custom developed based on our needs or is it a combination of software and hardware? I guess I'll take that. So it is a um, product that is configurable. Um, so I'll let you decide customization in that context. And in terms of the hardware, um, we do specify hardware for the vision systems specifically and if you need us to be part of the communication process in other words getting the information off your machines up into the cloud then yes we can help with that too but um, just as Stephen mentioned earlier if you've already got that covered and you know you've already got the data that you need then we'll pick it up and we'll process it through spyglass that way Okay, so I think that concludes our webinar. We've got all the questions answered. Again, thank you so much for attending. We know your time is valuable and we sincerely appreciate it. Uh, again, the slide deck will be available, will be sent out to you. And please feel free to email Stephen or Peter directly if you have questions about your specific challenges or emails are here on this last slide. But thank you again.